I believe that we're going to have a great time in the Lord tonight. There's nothing routine about tonight. It's not just another Saturday night. It's not just plugging away week after week. If God is in this room, then there is nothing routine about it. And to give him second best would be shortchanging God. I've been listening to uh, some old recordings of pop preaching about the reverential law of God. And I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose that. Let's just grasp that tonight. Let's just be in awe of Him and be free. Be free to worship Him with all of your might. Hold nothing back.
hurry tonight. God, we just worship you tonight, Lord. You are our only focus, God. Nothing else matters right now. We lay everything aside, God, every distraction, everything, Father, that we've been walking through this week, God. You're the God of all of it. You reign over all of it, God. Nothing can stand in the way of our worship of you except for us, God. And we crucify that right now, God. Our focus is on you. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare your living home your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free Yo 
thirsty soul, fountain of saving grace. Strength for the weary, hope whenever doubt may come. Peace in the darkest place. Sing that again. For the thirsty soul, fountain of saving grace, strength for the weary, hope whenever time may come. Your love peace in the darkest place. up your voice to him. Let him know that you love him. He's a good, good father. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You are so good to us, Father. We are thankful for you, God.
thought right there will cast out all fear in a second. The word says that God is love and that casts out fear. The idea that he loves me gives me such confidence I can't even explain. If he's a good, good father, then he's taking care of me. It means that nothing financial can scare me. It means that nothing in my path can intimidate me because I can't move without God's permission. He's a good, good father. He loves me. You're a good, good father It's who you are
worship you. Thank you for being in the room tonight, God. Thank you, God, for deeming us, Lord, worthy of your, your attention and your time, God. We worship you in this place, God. We invite you in, Father. We want to hear whatever you have to say tonight, tonight, God, whatever instruction you have or correction, God. We want to hear it, Father. We're open to you, God. We give this time to you, Lord. We're submitted to you, God, and the word that you have for us tonight. Love you so much, God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Peace in the darkest place. Always on time, never late. Has never let me down. Amen. Has never let me go. Amen. Peace in the darkest place. For those of you who may not know me or be watching online, who may not know who I am, my name is Justin Kitchen and I am a son of this ministry. God has used my time here in this ministry and mom and pop and all of you to encourage me, to build me up, to help me walk as the man of God that God is making me to be. And I'm thankful for a father in the Lord, a mother in the Lord, and a family that would hold that standard, that wouldn't allow a young man like myself to slip through the cracks, but to call me to what God has for me, not what man has for me, not the influence of earthly things, but the influence of what the Heavenly Father has for my life and what Jesus has for my life. Tonight, I want to preach to you about what God is dealing with my heart about. And it's really a simple thought. It's a simple Concept and that concept is he's always on time. He is never late, he is never running behind. He is always on schedule because it is his schedule to begin with. What seems like a pressing time and in time to us seems like decades and years to God. And what seems like a long lasting time to us seems like but only a second to him. See, his ways are above our understanding. But it doesn't mean that he won't communicate his ways to us. And that means that he will always, always come to save us. He will always show up in your time of need. It may not be exactly when you think it should happen. It may not fall exactly in line with what you think may be done, but God's timing is perfect. In Acts chapter 12, we find ourselves in a place where Christians 
are being persecuted for their belief in Jesus. Around this time, people had been hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. They had been hearing about his miracles. They had been witnessing miracles done by the apostles and other believers. They had seen the miraculous. But see, in that time, under King Herod, there was a group of Jews who did not like what was being preached, what was being taught of Jesus. And King Herod, we find, is a man who wanted to please the people. See, his goal was to be popular. His goal was to be appreciated by the people he governed, who he ruled over. And the people of that time, the Jews in that time, wanted nothing more than to bring down what Jesus Christ had begun to build. They wanted to bring down the church to persecute the Christians. So as that was the Jewish agenda at that time, that became King Herod's agenda in his pursuit of popularity. He brought harm and destruction to the Christians of that time. And as he began and continued to persecute Christians, his popularity grew. And what started as arresting a few Christians here and there, persecuting them a little bit here and there, eventually, as he thrived and hungered for that popularity and saw that it was pleasing to the Jews, it led him to murder. In chapter 12, verse 2, it says, and he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. I say he was murdered because in this chapter, we find nowhere where James was given a proper child. We find nowhere where he was innocent until proven guilty. He had zero opportunity to defend himself. He had no chance to speak out and to defend his faith. He was murdered. And when Herod saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to have Peter arrested as well. This was during the days of unleavened bread, the Passover week. Now, the reason that I emphasize King Herod's pursuit of popularity is because Paul says it best when we try to please men. In Galatians 1.10, he says, am I now trying to win the favor and approval of men or of God? Or am I seeking to please someone? If I were still trying to be popular with men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. So as King Herod pursued this popularity, does it make sense to you that he moved further and further away from the will of God to arresting Christians, to murdering them? And as he pursued Peter and arrested Peter, his goal was to have a public trial, and to execute him. And it's important to point out here that it wasn't just Peter who was being arrested at this time. It says he arrested Peter as well. There were other Christians being persecuted at this time. There were other Christians going through the trial of fire. There were other Christians going through persecution. Let me take this opportunity to tell you that whatever you're going through, whatever it feels like is overwhelming you, you are not alone. I will not stand up here. This is something God has put on my heart. And I know I've said it over and over again each week, but I keep God keeps bringing me back to this place. Whatever you're going through, you are not 
alone in this. There are other people in this room. There's other Christians in this country that are going through things similar to what you are going through. And God has not put you in a place where you are alone. He is with you. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are with you. And you do not have to do it alone. I know this story is about one man and it emphasizes one man and what God does for that man. But we are a body and we are in this together. And you do not have to do this alone. When Herod had seized Peter, he put him in prison, turning him over to four squads of soldiers, a four each to guard him in rotation throughout the night, planning after the Passover to bring him out before the people for execution. In my notes here, I have Passover underlined and we will come up to we will come back to that. He was planning to have him executed after the Passover. Before, when I've talked about or preached about this passage of Scripture, I talked about excessive force and how the enemy tries to come at us, overbearing us, overwhelming us, making it seem like it's impossible to get out. In this story, we have a situation where we have one man being guarded by 16 total soldiers, four at a time. For rotations throughout the night. Okay, we would have Peter chained to two guys inside the prison. So those guys had to sit with Peter, watch over him with whatever weapons they had at the time. I almost pointed down. I don't think they had that yet. (laughs) Then you've got two more soldiers waiting outside the door, keeping watch over if anything comes in and out. May I ask a question? Do you think that is possible That word had gotten back to the king and to the Jews at what was going on in the Christian community at that time. God had to be God had to be doing miraculous things, wonderful things, escaping Christians from tough situations, from lockdown, from bondage and setting them free to the point that he felt it necessary that 16 guards be responsible for what this man was capable of and with God inside of him. To me, that is recognition of Christ. That is recognition of the power of Christ. Whether he believed it or not, he believed that Peter was was capable of things greater than a common man, than a common Jew. So when we are dealing with situations, when we are going through things, let us not forget that excessive force, when it seems overwhelming, is just to throw us off. That is not one thing that God cannot overcome. That is not one thing that God can't do and move completely out of your way in a miraculous way or just a day to day walk. There is nothing that can hold you down. There's nothing that can overcome you that Jesus has not over overcome. King Herod thought by putting this much pressure on Peter, putting this many men around him, suppressing him to the point that he was chained to two of them, locked in jail, two more men guarding him. King Herod thought that that would keep him in confinement. King Herod does not know the God that we serve. And this is where I want to get to the point I'm trying to make tonight, that God is always on time. In verse five, it says, so Peter was kept in prison. But fervent and persistent prayer for him was being made to God by the church. When I read that sentence there, it says, so Peter was kept in prison. That is a statement right there. He was in prison. Then when I see the but, B-U-T, but fervent, per, uh, fervent and persistent prayer for him was being made by the church, that first part before that comma becomes null and void to me. Amen. It no longer becomes important. What becomes important is that Peter has men and women of God praying for his situation. This man is about to be on trial. I say trial because all it says is King Herod wanted to bring him before the people to execute him. That is a staged trial. This man is in prison to be killed. That is a important fact that we cannot overlook. However, something bigger was happening. 
something bigger than the threat of death, something bigger than the threat of what the enemy can do to you, something bigger than him tearing you down. Prayer was happening. And I mean persistent prayer, unwilling to back down, unwilling to give up and unwilling to quit. See, this is a time I'm telling you that Christians were being persecuted, arrested for what they believed. And yet these people, these men and women of God continued in their faith. They continued in their belief and they prayed to God for Peter. They stood with Peter. They may not have been in jail with him right then. They may not have spent every second with him, but they, he, they were with him. Amen. Regardless of the news, regardless of the report, could you imagine getting report after report? We're getting arrested, thrown in jail, and they put Peter with 16 guys. He ain't getting out of that. It'd be easy to start thinking that way. But they remained steadfast. Amen. Things got worse. They pressed on more. The situation declined. They gave more. Death was knocking at their brother's door. They prayed and got in agreement more. Amen. They were the church. It was their calling. It was their duty to join with Peter in that situation. To come alongside their brother and lift him up in a time of darkness. Peace in the darkest place. They didn't have special resumes. They weren't a special congregation, but I'll tell you what they did have. They had unity. They had relationship. Enough relationship with this man that they would sacrifice their time, their energy, their effort to come alongside him. They had agreement. And they were willing, willing to sacrifice their time, willing to put in the time, willing to do what was necessary. And they had a powerful weapon. Something simple, something that I think we all at times overlook prayer. Sometimes it's easy to look at prayer as the cop out answer. Well, we'll pray about it. We'll get in agreement with it and we'll pray about it. But that is a powerful tool that God gives us. It's a powerful weapon in the kingdom of God. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes lives, situations, hearts, circumstances. And prayer moves the heart of God. That's why I'm thankful to be a part of a ministry that has taught me to pray. Not just pray how I feel or what I want, but to pray what the word of God says. To literally step out and watch God change situations. To watch things happen. Things move in the body. Things move in families. Things move, things move in jobs financially. Prayer changes things. James chapter 5 verse 16 says the, it ends with this. The heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man. Then right after a righteous man, it says a believer can accomplish much. You know, I said earlier that the men and the women of God who were praying for Peter had no special resume. Let me add one thing to that. These were righteous men right. and women of God. Amen. When I used to read the word righteous, I'd get a little overwhelmed. Righteous, what do I have to do to be righteous? Sounds like a daunting task. That's a lot to ask, right? I love that right after it says, the prayer of a righteous man, a believer. Someone who believes in Jesus. Someone does what is necessary to walk out their life in a way that they have faith and belief in Jesus, the one who came, who one who died for us and the one who rose again, that now sits at the right hand of the father and intercedes on our behalf. Amen. A righteous man or woman, a believer can accomplish much. When put into action. And made effective by God. When we pray, God responds. 
God takes our prayers and he puts them into action. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. You want to be powerful? You want to be a powerful instrument for the kingdom? Pray. Pray. And if you don't know how to pray, call one of the men of iron and we'll help you with that. We will come alongside you and say we were going to learn to pray the word over your situation, over your family situation, over our brothers and sisters in Christ situation, over our father in the Lord situation. We are going to unite together and move the heart of God because he is always on time. And we have to learn to take what we are learning, what we are being taught and apply it. We talk about that a lot down here. We have to apply it. That's not going to go away. We have to continue to go this way with God and take it out these doors and use what we are being taught. Put it into practice and pray it and pray it. You know, in that verse, the heartfelt and persistent prayer, we see persistent again. I think it's important that we go back and define persistent. It's an adjective and it means continually continuing firmly in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. We are naive if we think the enemy is not going to come against our prayer. We are naive if we don't think that we are going to face some opposition in this. But being persistent in it means moving forward regardless of what gets in our way. Regardless of any persecution, regardless of anything feeling like it's holding us down, we must remain persistent. It also means continuing to endure over a prolonged period. Not just one time standing up and being like, I got this. I prayed tonight. We're good. But consistently praying when it gets tough, when you get tired, when we can't seem to quite muster up the energy. Continuing in that persistent prayer. Now, it's important to also recognize the timing in which Peter had been arrested. I talked about the week of the Passover celebration And you have to follow me on this. I switched it up a little bit in my notes, but just stay with me. If we go back to verse three, it says, and when he saw talking about Herod, that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to have Peter arrested as well. This was during the days of unleavened bread, the Passover week. Peter was taken into captivity during the Passover celebration. You may ask, why is that important? And I'm glad that you did. Because the Passover celebration was a time to celebrate God setting free the Israelites from captivity, from bondage to the Egyptians. It was a time to remember God setting free his people from bondage. It was a celebration. It was a time to be happy. It was a time to be festive. But I'm here to tell you tonight, sometimes it is not convenient to act in persistent prayer. Sometimes you could be out having a party. You could be out. You could be out celebrating. This was a time to celebrate what God was doing. Yet we find a brother in the Lord in prison. And the people laying down the celebration, laying down the time to seek God in prayer. Do you see in this what the enemy can do? How he can try to overwhelm you mentally to try to take away from your day to day, take away from your plans, take away from what you want to do. Don't let them steal that from you. Don't let them take that from you. 
Let us get to the point, all of us, myself included, that prayer is no longer this sacrifice. This thing that I've got to give up something to do it. But yet I look forward to going to prayer, to fight alongside my brothers and sisters in Christ, to fight alongside my father in the Lord who needs our prayers right now. This was a time of celebration. But there's no celebration like our brothers and sisters being set free. Verse six says the very night before Herod was to bring him forward. This is the very night before Herod is going to have Peter killed. Have him executed. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And sentries were in front of the door guarding the prison. Here we go again. Excessive force. Not only are we going to kill you tomorrow, we're going to keep four guys on you. Two on your side, two outside the door. You're not going anywhere. You are going to die tomorrow. I know me personally, I have a hard time sleeping if I think I'm going to have to confront somebody at work the next day, let alone about to die. I guess I'm alone in that, huh? Y'all are better than me. I have a hard. It's all right. That's just agreement. It's OK. I have a hard time sleeping if I think I have a hard workout the next day. But let alone thinking that this is it. Tomorrow I die. Life's over. Be a hard way to get a good night's sleep, if you ask me. But it didn't seem to bother this man of God. It didn't seem to steal away what the enemy was trying to steal from him. See, to me, this is the definition of God's peace. This is the definition of peace that transcends all understanding. This doesn't make sense. Executed the next day. I'm going to take a nap. That ain't that doesn't even add up. But this sounds like a man that understood this. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything, about anything, but in every circumstance and in everything by prayer. And petition, definite request with Thanksgiving. I'm not going to get off on Thanksgiving. That is a different message. But you cannot bring your prayers and your requests to God without a thankful heart. Continue to make your wants known to God and God's peace. The peace that allows you to rest when everything is coming against you. When there's nowhere left to turn, there's no way out. God's peace shall be yours. That tranquil state of a soul of of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. Peter was a man that understood that Christ died for him, that Christ rose again, that Christ sits at the right hand of the father and that he intercedes on Peter's behalf. Peter understood that that was his salvation. That was his savior. When you understand that, when you really get that deep down inside of you and realize that no one here on this earth can take that from you, they can't steal that from you, no matter how the enemy comes against you, he can't have it, he can't do anything about it, and he can't kill you, you will be able to sleep. (laughs) In that situation, when you realize that heaven will be your home. And I'm saying that to you in here. If you believe in Jesus, heaven will be your home. When that gets down deep inside of you, when you realize Jesus died for everything that you are, whoever you are. 
As long as you believe in Him, salvation is free. But everything else is going to cost you. It cost Peter some of his time. And in this situation, it almost cost him his life. But Jesus, but God, but the people who were fellow believers of him, the church had a different plan. That's the kind of man that I believe understood what Psalms 118, 6 says. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Man cannot steal your salvation. Man cannot take Jesus away from you. And man cannot steal your peace. Only you can let him have it. Moving on to verse 7 back in Acts 12. It says, suddenly... And I love suddenly because that to me is a reminder that God's on time. Here he comes. Things don't look right. Things aren't going the way that I thought they ought to. Things aren't going the way that God told me they were going to. They weren't going the way that we had talked about in prayer. But here he comes to do more and far beyond anything. That I can comprehend to take me further than I ever thought I can go. Suddenly. An angel, of the Lord appeared beside him and a light shone in the cell. The angel struck Peter's side and awakened him, saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Now, I don't know about y'all, but my wife might be one of the lightest sleepers that I've ever met in my life. Whether it's a peaceful time or a hard time, if something moves, she's going to wake up. She's going to wake up. I'm going to sleep. The ground could shake. (laughs) Things could fall in the kitchen. I'm going to sleep. She will wake up. The reason I point that out is because if someone turned the light on in the room, She's sitting up like, I don't know if any of you are like that as well. But I'd like to point out that Peter was resting so hard. He was sleeping so hard in a time where his life was on the line. That light shone into the cell and an angel appeared. And my man didn't even move. (laughs) He didn't even flinch. Like, excuse me, I'm trying to sleep right now. Just give me two seconds. This is some of the best rest that I've gotten in months. I've been traveling, doing the God's work. Just let me sleep. Light shone into the cell and he didn't move. He didn't move to the point that the angels had to say, hey, get up. Wake up. But I love it when he wakes up. The chains fall off. This is a quick side note. God's been dealing with my heart about this this week. He's been dealing with my heart about this this week. When he calls on you in the middle of the night. Let me rephrase that. When he calls on us in the middle of the night and he has something to talk to us about, something to show us in his word. Get up. It could be the thing that sets you free. It could be the thing that makes the chains fall off. Whatever the enemy's tempting you with, whatever he's coming against you with, it could be the thing that shuts that down right then and there. That's worth a little less sleep. That's worth getting up and saying, well, I got a long day tomorrow. I got to work. I got to deal with this person. I got to turn this in. My financials are this. Audit here. It's going to be okay because you get that chain off of you back here. All that's going to be a lot easier to deal with. The angel said to him, prepare yourself. 
I love this. This is exactly what God's direction does. This is exactly what God's influence on our life does when he comes and he speaks to us. When he's saving us from a dangerous place, he's preparing us. Prepare yourself. Get ready because we're going somewhere else next. I'm taking you from this place that you're struggling in, that you're having a hard time in, that you can't seem to get out of on your own. I'm taking you from here and I'm moving you. Prepare yourself. Get yourself ready. Get yourself ready in here. Get yourself ready in here. We're moving. And strap on your sandals to get ready for whatever may happen. It's easy to assume that the angel is there to save Peter. Not only because we know the story, but the angel showed up. That's our that's help. We're about to move out of this place. But the angel says, prepare yourself for whatever may happen next. We don't need to know the exact step by step by step of God's plan and what he wants to do in our lives. And it doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to line up the way we think it should line up. All that matters is that it lines up the way that he planned it to line up. Prepare yourself not for what you want to do, not for what how we want to do it, but for the way that God has set before us. To get ready for whatever may be next. May our focus be on what God wants. Always on time, never late to show up, but may we be willing to go with him when he does. May our heart be just turned towards him in a way that we were unwilling not to get up to hear what he has to say. And it says, and Peter did so. I'm going to read a little bit of scripture right now. And Peter did so. Then the angel told him, put on your robe and follow me. And Peter went out following the angel. He did not realize that he was. He did not realize that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first guard and the second, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city. Of its own accord, it swung open for them, and they went out and went along one street. And at once the angel left him. When Peter came to his senses, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish, all that the Jewish people were expecting. To do to me. This man of God just walked out of jail without touching anything. Chains fell off, gates open, guards asleep. All he had to do was just follow. All he had to do was get out of the way and follow. He had to submit to what the angel said and follow. We know that Peter then goes to the house of Mary. And it's easy to focus on what happens there in the sense that he knocks on the door. Rhoda answers it or no, she doesn't answer it. She hears his voice outside and she runs back in to all the people who are praying. We're having a big prayer meeting here. Peter's going to be set free. She runs in. Hey, he's outside. He's outside. (laughs) That's just his angel girl. You don't know what you're talking about. We're praying. (laughs) What have I told you about interrupting us when we're praying? She runs. Y'all, y'all don't understand. This man is outside. I told you they weren't perfect. They didn't do everything perfect. They didn't always believe exactly right, but they sacrificed the time to pray for that man of God. And I love, I'm going to close with this. I love what Peter does when he comes in. I got to admit, I would come in hugging y'all like y'all won't believe this. I'm 
free and then this and this. But I'll be coming in trying to figure out what's going on, what y'all been doing, what's going on. Peter moved directly into testimony of what God did. He didn't talk about himself. He didn't talk about the situation. He said, God did this and this and this and set me free. That is why God does things in our lives. He loves us. He wants what's best for us. But then we return it to him by giving testimony to the goodness of his name, giving glory and honor to the greatness of who he is, how he has set us free. When I was lost and couldn't be found, when people were praying for me and interceding on my behalf, I needed them so that I could be set free so that God would move in my life and so that I can give testimony to who he is. Glory and honor to his name. But motioning to them with his hand to be quiet. Hey, I know y'all are excited. I know y'all are excited that I'm here. But listen. He described how the Lord had led him out of prison. And then what did he do? He said, go out and report these things to James and the brothers and sisters. Then he left and went to another place. He said, take what I've taught you. Take what God just did. Take what you've learned here tonight. Take the miraculous power of God out and tell somebody. Tell somebody that I am free. Tell somebody that they couldn't hold me down because of your prayer and God's love for me, his willingness to deliver me and set me free. Go tell somebody. Go share it with the world. And the second point, my last, is the continued safety and freedom. Verse 19 says, when Herod had searched for him, him being Peter, and could not find him, he interrogated the guards and commanded that they be led away to execution. Not Peter. Peter had been set free. We serve a God that not only sets us free, but hides us in a safe place that doesn't leave you stranded. He doesn't set you free so that you can fall back into the same thing, fall back into the same imprisonment, fall back into the same bondage. No, he sets you free to stay free. John 8, 36 says, so if the son makes you free then you are unquestionably free. Nobody can take that from you. No one can take you back to the bondage that you used to struggle with from the place that God saved you from and put you back into that place. Peter didn't go hide. He didn't say, I'm free. I'm going to go lay low for a while. He went right back and gave testimony to the goodness of God. And because of his willingness to confess what God had done, God continued to keep him safe. He couldn't be found. That thing that was trying to trap him could no longer trap him. That thing that was trying to kill him could no longer kill him because God arrived right on time. Let me pray for us. God, may our faith be continually growing in you. May our heart for prayer be continually growing in you. Lord, thank you that you hear our prayers, that you respond, that you answer. May our hearts be turned towards you in a way that we never even knew possible, Lord. May we be hungry for who you are, passionate for who you are, God. We thank you for your safety, Lord God. 
We thank you for your protection. We meet, may we be a people who unite in prayer to serve you. And may your will be done. Lord, we thank you that you are always on time, that you have never let us down, that you're never late. There's no thing you can't do, nothing you can't overcome, nothing that you haven't already overcome. We trust you. And may our lives be lived to honor you, to bring glory and honor to your name, testimony to the goodness of your name, God. May we not be a shy people, but may we be a brave people willing to share what you are doing, God, how you are doing it, and that you're always on time. It is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. We now have the opportunity to worship God with our tithe and our offering. And just to take from what I was just preaching God is always on time. I can't say that enough tonight. And that applies financially as well. Whatever you're believing God for, whatever you're waiting on him to do, this is your time. This is your time to show him your faithfulness, your obedience, and he will show up. He will be there right on time. He will not let you down. His word is tried and it is true. So give and it shall be given unto you. Thank you. For those of you online, um, if you would like to give, you can go right to the page for giving. It's right there beside where you're watching this. Broadcast and make sure you fill out all the information for us, please. We need that to make the transaction go through. We're not going to email you or bother you or um, send you anything or put you on a prayer or an email list. But at the bottom, there's a comments section. If you would like to leave a prayer request or let us know what God's doing in your life, please do not hesitate. And we will pray for you or we will join us alongside you, just praising God for what He's doing in your life. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. God bless you and have a good night.